Let's not talk Christine. about the conference up till then. <laughs> okay. Actually, I better put this one there. Yeah, no issue at all. Okay, you want me to mute you? I can mute you. Okay. So basically, the World Mediators Conference. The idea was to come out with a mediation vision 2026. Let's just discuss various things. And throughout the year and over the next four years now, let's just talk about whatever we need to do for the evolution of mediators and mediation. That's why you see it up there. And we started on 18th May with Ken Cloak's birthday. He celebrated his birthday with us. Very nice of him. And I'm celebrating 18th May as World Mediators Day. Because the wonderful person, the beautiful soul that Ken is, he just for me, is what a mediator, as we have to have a person, a face of mediators, and he is that person. So that's how this conference came up. And of course, it's going to happen every year. If you want to participate, please get in touch. So also, let me take you through the various sessions that have happened. So... If you're, if you're back, then I'm okay. I was just going through the, I, I just said, like, I don't know how much time you're going to take. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this schedule is out there in on social media. Please have a look at it. Oh, of course, now there are what? There are going to be some 93 sessions showing here, but actually 93 did not take this. A few did not take place with someone had COVID and someone could not make it. But okay, about 90 sessions. So that's how it is. So Roshin, Thank you very much for coming in. And you're very welcome. <laughs> and of course, the topic obviously is something that we have to keep discussing. It's not going to be, I mean, mediation legislation, what and why. There's so much that's going to happen here also. And of course, we'll get in more people from other places as we go along. I think that by itself can be a symposium, I think. I think so. Um, yeah, and look, you know, I've spoken at two symposiums in um, Canada, so British Columbia and Ontario on legislation and regulation and frameworks around mediation. And I suppose one thing that I am surprised about is that um, the people are still asking, is mediation a profession? Well, well yes, it is. <laughs> That's my view. <laughs> and we had we had three sessions, you know that. But no, it's, it's not so easy, Roshan. It's not going to happen so easily if you think. It all starts with you telling us about the conference. This is a new session. The new session starts. Nate introduced the conference in that one. You have to tell us about the conference, and then we go go from there. Okay. So have we started? We have. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. We started so, that when you were gone. So, <laughs> so this is your this is your initiative, and you're you're basically celebrating the birthday of um, Ken. And you put together this series of conversational pieces with mediators from all over the world. Um, and it's, it's really innovative and really unusual. It was something I started to think about myself, but not on the scale. So congratulations for bringing so many mediators together. And to talk on very specific little pieces, it's like bite-sized pieces of the space that we all work in. So this conference is amazing, Vikram. So congratulations on doing it. And, you know, I think it goes for another another few days, does it? Yeah, Thursday is the last. 30th is the last Thursday. day. Yeah, yeah so you, you've covered an incredible array of uh, topics already. I've listened to a lot of them. And I'm going to, the fact that we can actually look at them on YouTube and go back and listen to pieces, that that's fantastic. So I think so. I I was delighted to happen to see one on LinkedIn, and then I reached out to you, and that's how I've ended up here today. <laughs> that's exactly what I want people to do. Just reach out. Let's just. There's so many conversations we have to have. So many interesting yes. things that people have. So let's. I mean, what am I doing? I just create that platform, and I just love the conversation. So there's so much we can do there. The interesting one we had in the morning, I mean, afternoon or my afternoon was on neuro-linguistic programming and mediation. That was really interesting. So new, new things I mean, for me also to find out and learn about, which is what I keep saying. Look, I'm, a, I'm an illiterate and I know nothing. So just <laughs> tell me everything about everything. I'm so happy. <laughs> well, I think, I think our session now, we're going to talk about legislation. And I suppose... I'm going to speak from the perspective of what's happening in Ireland. And I think what's no, happening... It's not going to be that easy. You still have to tell us about yourself. <laughs> you, you just want to dive into the topic. No, it can't happen so easy. <laughs> People have to know you. I have to know you. Where are you coming from? Okay. So um, 
I've been practicing as a mediator for 12 years. Uh, before that, I was full time practicing as an artist, painter, watercolor painter. And you can you can Google me and you'll find my work. Um, and the only reason I, I my uh, one thing I would say is that I'm very open to life and changes that life might bring. I've never been somebody that worried about being on a particular path or or, or taking a particular direction. I was always open to things could change. Painting is the constant because it, it when I paint, um, my, my mind shuts down because I think all the time. I'm always thinking. So when I paint, that stops. So that's my therapy. That's my quiet space. That's how I manage uh, to kind of just come to peace when I finish a painting, I'm quiet and I'm ready again for the world. So, so it helps me, um, it helps me deal with the problems of living. Everybody has problems with living. <laughs> there are stresses in all of our lives. Um, but painting is definitely really, really therapeutic for me. And where, um, is, where is this place? This is Waterford Keys in County Waterford. And this is where I live. Wow. Um, and so this painting is, um, do you see the tower to the left hand side? Mm -hmm. That's that's called Reginald's Tower, and my ancestor Ophwelon fought uh, the, the the forces of Strongbow who came in and invaded. Uh, I think it was around the 10th century, um, and he he surrendered. Fortunately, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so he, he surrendered, and then there was a wedding done between the the, the invading tribe and, and our guys. So um, our 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 but our people's blended you know so so i think this is one of the things about human human conflict that we can go to war with one another we can fight one another and then we can love one another and, and we can create new tribes and and so really the whole we, we align as tribes and tribes and a lot and these kind of alliances can create conflict in themselves but and this so, is this is a watercolor this is a watercolor painting, yeah. And I not had, I mean, you get this kind of thing that you've done reflection in the water. Yeah. Not, I'm sure that's not easy to do. Um, I used to worry about how to do, how to paint. When I when I was much younger, I used to create sort of squares all over the page and try and control what I was doing and really work it out almost mathematically. And then, as time went on, I realized, no, no, I I can see it. I can do it by just seeing it and just letting myself see it. And now I don't don't plan the painting at all. It actually just happens really quickly. And so years ago, if somebody said to me, can you paint reflections? I would have said no. Now I say, oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> because I just I just let myself see it and I let myself, you know, work with it. <laughs> what I do is I put up on Facebook how a, a painting evolves so because I want to show because people learn from this they say how do you do your paintings well this is how I do my paintings so I draw them first and I create the framework and then I paint on top of it so that's how I do it um, and so the painting pathway you know I came to a situation where my own marriage ended I ended up in the legal system getting a separation it was very destructive because I, I had no experience of law or the legal system before that. And most people don't. They don't. Most people, fortunately, in their lives don't end up in that system. And it's a really horrendous experience when you've never had any dealings with the court. Um, but I found the language, although it was English, I found the language so alien and, and the processes so alien. And it was the most... Uh, adversarial environment that I've ever been in and utterly toxic so it it even I who I'm a I'm a peaceful person I'm very laid back I'm very calm I'm very you know something goes wrong I can work with it even I started reacting to letters from the solicitor for the other person and becoming angry by those words and wanting to send angry words back and so that whole system encourages us to go to our negative space and it encourages us to it encourages us to take positions and to fight and so I found myself moving into that space whereas in life I'd never felt like fighting with anybody ever <laughs> but this whole framework encouraged me to so I had to I had to struggle to pull myself back from that and not get harmed by it um, and when I when I was going through it I said okay I'm going to go back to college and I'm going to study law because I don't understand this space. I don't understand this language they're speaking and it, 
you know, if I don't understand something, I want to know more. So I did a law degree and my family were really worried because they thought I was having a, a nervous breakdown <laughs> because, because up until that point for my family, you know, in families, people say, oh, you know, Mary's the, the solicitor, John's the accountant. And, and then it was like, you know, and oh, yeah, this girl. Oh, yeah, she's the artist. So I was always the artist and not the academic in my family. And I always believed I wasn't an academic and didn't have that type of brain functioning that I was an artist. And that's what I did. So when I did the law degree, my family were very supportive, saying to me, when you fail, we're here. This won't work out. <laughs> you won't be able to do this because this is not you. And when, it, when, when you crash and burn, we're here. Now, they were being supportive, but I suppose that was actually the best thing they could have done because when I'm challenged and told I can't do something, then everything in me comes forward and I say, okay, I will do this thing. So I got a first class honours, which was quite a surprise. <laughs> but at the end of doing law, I went and did a mediation training programme. And when I did this, I thought, ah, this is it. This is how to resolve conflict. Now, I wasn't completely crazy about the training. I didn't know enough yet, but, but all the right pieces were there. I began to see this was, the, this was a dispute resolution space. Um, and then I ended up doing research, a PhD, because I, I wanted to see more about what was going wrong in the family courts in Ireland. So I watched 1,200 cases. And then I started, you know, beginning to work on trying to change things in Ireland. So fighting to change the system, doing what I could through lobbying, through academic work, through writing, while practicing as a mediator. Um, and I remember my very first mediation. <laughs> One thing that, that I think is a problem about the mediation space is, are we really serious when we say that somebody can do 60 hours training and they're a mediator? Um, on the other side, Roshi, you're now picking up a very different topic. This is a whole topic by itself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, we'll discuss. We can discuss this because in a way, it'll be connected to legislation also. So oh, no, it is. I'm, I'm taking yeah. us there, but, yeah. but essentially... No, 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 it is. I mean, the, what you're saying right now about the training part of it is, can all, is also connected to legislation. Yeah. So I'm perfectly all right. So, so I sort of, I, you know, I think there are certainly personality types that are really suited to being mediators. Um, but I also think most people, or many people anyway, can, can get skill sets from a certain amount of training and can bring out their ability to be a good mediator. But there are some people who just have it. Um, but, but I do remember my very, very first mediation sitting there with the two people and inside my head I was screaming because I had 60 hours and then I'm sitting with two people. So I, I just was myself. I just had to be me and forget about the training. <laughs> And just and just be me and work with the people. And as I came on through the years of doing mediation, I've been doing more and more mediation. I do mediation Monday to Friday every week. In 2010, 2010, we set up a practice, so ARC Mediation. Um, and so there's two, two of us who are partners and, and eight associates. And so there's a good bit of work. Um, and I love it. And I did, I've done, I did a research project, a family mediation research project, where I went around the world looking for all the best bits that I could find that worked in family mediation and I brought them all together and I test ran a model. And while all of that was happening in the background was this conversation about legislation. So back, you know, I think it was about 15, 20 years ago, the Law Reform Commission had produced a paper saying, um, we can't have all these people who are holding themselves out as mediators and conciliators and what are they and what are the training standards? and People are going to them looking for a service and we don't know what it is. So, so it was a 249 page report saying, here's why the public needs some more clarity around what is this. So the report suggested that there'd be legislative framework for mediation, not to interfere with mediation as it was evolving, but to create some framework around, uh, to give a definition to say when mediation started, to say, when mediation um, could be legally binding, when mediation was not intended to be binding. So um, they actually did a draft bill. And I think it was really unusual for legislation to come from the Law Reform Commission, and it, it, not driven by mediators, not driven by the courts, not driven by anything else. 
Um, so that that bill just sat there for nearly 12 years. It's sort of, you know, every now and then the government or somebody would get excited and bring it back up again. But there was no real interest in mediation. And so there was no real appetite to move this on. And so it took 12 years. And then the, the, the Department of Justice just said, look, we need to get this done. So they invited quite a few of us as stakeholders to come in and talk. And I think what worried me was the submissions I began to read and the submissions from the legal professions were very concerned with a mediation act that allowed mediators to do legally binding agreements if they were wanted, uh, that mediation could be any form of dispute. They wanted it narrowed to, to that the act would only apply to certain kinds of disputes and say so wouldn't apply to family disputes. Um, and so, so there was a lot of I suppose, I remember there's a friend of mine, um, David Hodson, who's a mediator in London, and he's a lawyer. He's the head of the International Family Law Practice, but he's also a mediator and a part-time judge. And he said to me many years ago that in the mediation space in the UK, he had never seen such entrenched tribal fighting. You know, that that, that this space was fraught with the one true way, different tribes feeling that they had the one way to do this thing and fighting with each other and, and competing with one another and pushing at each other. And the same thing happened around the Mediation Act. The different interests around mediation weren't aligned. So, so the legal professionals were not aligned with those who favored therapeutic mediation, with those who favored other forms of mediation. So it was a very interesting period and went on for quite a period of time. And then suddenly in January 1st, 2018, the law came through the whole thing which is really unusual because when legislation is developed, usually there's just a piece that gets enacted and later on other pieces of it come through. Well, January 1st, 2018, the whole darn thing came in. <laughs> I mean, oh, you, yeah. You'd think that after 12 years, everybody would be prepared that this might happen. Nobody was prepared, <laughs> least but, of all mediators. <laughs> but I tell you what, the thing is, Roshan, we have to first of all start from that basic thing that you said that they are doing something, some people are doing something and we have to get into it. This is what I keep saying that the whole colonization mindset, this is what that mindset is. How yeah. are people doing something on their own? The government and the judiciary are not part of it. How does that happen? Dispute resolution has to happen in the courts and lawyers have to be part of it. If it's happening, otherwise there's an issue somewhere. Let's get into it. That's what I'm trying. First, first of all, questioning that step itself. Are you going to go into people's houses and are you going to tell them whom to sit with? That's the colonizer. Don't do it. Let's let them be. They, it's their dispute. They know whom they can trust. Let me tell you guys, whatever you might say, I am telling you people don't go outside and pick up anyone and be the mediator. They will have to trust the person. You can put out panels of lawyers. All bar council, say, bar, bar council Delhi. All our names are out there. All the whole directory is out there. No one goes there to look for us. No one does that. No one picks up a lawyer like that. So I think this is someone has, I don't know why they have to get into it. We have to change that mindset first because from that mindset comes the draft of the legislation. Then it goes to people who are looking at it from that mindset. Finally, what comes out alienates the people. Yes, you've put a structure in place. We want mediation to be used. We don't want to keep that law in a nice library somewhere. Oh, we've got a law. So this is where you have to connect for me, how you look at this. Well, and you see, I, the approach of the Law Reform Commission wasn't about uh, making it sit properly inside the court system. Interestingly enough, the, their approach was, this is a separate space and it needs to be defined. And, and, and it needs to be clear when it does come near the court system, how does it connect? But what was really interesting was that this was the first time the Law Reform Commission were basically saying, this is a separate professional activity. This is a standalone activity. And, and I think probably what was happening, um, like my own PhD, I had findings on this as well. Mediated agreements were coming into court all the time. And the people who had got these agreements found that the judges wouldn't turn these agreements into orders, didn't like these agreements, were objecting to the way that they were structured or they weren't dealing with the issues. So there was sort of a, 
not a standoff, but there was a tension between the freedom of what mediation can be and the, and the flexibility of the outcomes and when people were looking for something that they needed to be enforceable or able to be enforced. Um, and I think what was really a very interesting thing that happened from my perspective. So up until January 1st, 2018, about 95% of the work that I was getting was coming through solicitor referral. So people were going to solicitors first and solicitors were sending me the worst of the cases. They were the cases they weren't going to get paid from or they were really tough or a lot of tension or, and I will mediate domestic violence cases. So, so I was getting really difficult, uh, tough, tough cases, but I, I, I cut my teeth on these and, and I, I really, it was, it was a powerful learning space. But after January 1st, 2018, those referrals went off a cliff. They dropped to 3%. So the impact of the Mediation Act, commencement of the Mediation Act, was that solicitors in particular went, uh, okay, we're not sending any more work, you know, because the realization hit, and it's, it's you know, we need to be honest and open about these things. The re realization hit that this piece of law actually allows mediators to draft legally binding settlements something, an activity that solicitors had been doing up until this point. And so therefore it would, it would eat into the financial space, uh, the piece of the pie that solicitors would normally get. So there is that tension in Ireland now that solicitors, particularly solicitors who practice family law can see that those mediators who practice family mediation are charging a lot less or doing the agreements that people need and then the lawyers are not getting the money that they would normally get from this. Roshan, let me tell you, lawyers can say what they want. I can represent myself, even if I'm not a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, that's a different thing. But if I'm not a lawyer yeah. also, I can represent myself in the court. You cannot object to it. A lawyer cannot object to me standing in my own case and arguing. Yes. So now a person who enters into an agreement, putting them in their own words, you want to object to that. Now you can, courts can say, oh, this person is coming into the court, doesn't know anything about how to handle themselves in the court. So we won't allow you to represent yourself. It doesn't work that way. Please, we have to move out of that mindset. You're here trying to work with people. Okay, you've seen some issues coming up. Supposing, okay, this, this some settlement agreement came to the court and it was certain things in it. What could be the thing in it? If you want the language to be the 19, 1800s language, which we are using no. in our courts. No, I'm just giving you an example. In our, yeah. in our courts, Today, the language is what the British gave us, I and mean, they must be using it in 1800s. Showeth. Where does the word showeth? Who uses the word showeth? It's in our, in our, with. <laughs> yeah, in our pleadings in the courts, these things still go there. I mean, look, we have to bring out, first of all, we have to change the mindset of the people who are in that dispute resolution space as people know that dispute resolution space. For me, dispute resolution has to happen in various places. We have yeah. to first get these people out of that mindset that it's not only the courts and connecting mediation to the courts has by itself even worsened that. Mediation had nothing to do with the courts. It was It's a totally different process. I keep saying diametrically opposite process. You connected it there. Today, we facing this problem in India, that the judges are taking over that space now, which we will be having a discussion tomorrow. There's a senior mediator of ours who's a pioneer in, in relation to setting up the court mediation center. He's gone out all out on some judges of the Supreme Courts who are actually serving judges who've gone and set up a private uh, 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 a private center mediation arbitration mediation center taken That's land insane. from the government which is like i think what in terms of pounds or dollars will be about i would say about i think about 30 million pounds or dollars 30 million dollars you get a land because you're a supreme court judge and this is what i've read from the facts that he's put out there i mean i'm not i don't want to investigate that the point is his issue now is that the judges are putting it out as their field. Okay, so it's like, the, because like I said, the colonial mindset, the dispute resolution connected to courts, then the judges. So we are, if you're going to take mediation into that direction, first of all, what kind of mediation? In the US also, judges came out and did set up jams. So there, there, there is a certain space for that. I'm sure people want that, so someone to tell them what to do. Well, perfectly all right, not a problem. 
But the fact is that you hear the only mediation ha that happens is in the court system. There are only very few people like me. I, I would actually, I mean, I can count them on my fingertips kind of thing. We're doing mediations solely out of the court system, private mediation as we call them. So today mediation is connected with the courts. Courts, of course, are connected to the judges and you move out into the private space with the judges. If you have a mediation center opening, judges are inaugurating it. It's all judges. I mean, we have to. So it's a mindset which is going to keep going in that direction. No one is going to let you take it off that. And I will keep fighting it on the other side. Keep saying that it's people. It's a people's process. They know how to. They if they are putting something down on paper, and if it is like I kept said in the last session, I'll have to repeat it here because it's a different session. If it is fair, reasonable, just, equitable, if people sit together, and that is what our parliaments are supposed to be. That's the kind of discussions you were supposed to have. And what our parliaments are made from people who are who, they are people of that country. So if they sit together and they write something down. Just because they don't use your language, is, this, is yeah. there something that you're going to object to? Are you not going to let them do their work, then get into their lives, into their houses, whom you're sitting with? We will tell you whom to sit with. So these are issues that I have with that. I, if I, I might sound a little, I, think, I might sound like that. Don't, I, it's okay. I'm no, okay. no, no, that was, that was really interesting because I think, you see, in Ireland, we've always, we've always, we are post colonial. As well, right? And so we 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 tend to reject authority, and we tend to reject systems. I know this sounds a little curious, but mediation in Ireland is moving a different direction. So what's happening is that um, while the, the courts have replicated the 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 UK style of courts, and and you know we we replicated the system of barristers, and you know we 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 just took that all on board. There is a movement here that's very strong that that not only um, mediators but but the court system and the documents plain English. Everything is moving away from that archaic language. In fact, um, the training being given to lawyers and barristers now is to stop using that language because that is language that is that is deliberately inaccessible and 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 out, it's out, it's not used. So the idea is to get back to very plain English. And I think some mediators are making the mistake of starting to draft agreements use, using legal language. It's a really weird thing. They're starting to use the legal language that the lawyers are now moving away from. So, so really what the change here that's different to what you're describing is that mediation and the way I'm viewing mediation, I'm, I'm a standalone private mediator. I don't have anything to do with the courts. Mm -hmm. And the mediators who are members of the organization that I've set up set up are all independent mediators as well. So there's 56 of them. And what we're doing is pushing to have mediation as the first place you go with the dispute. And you may never go near a courtroom. The, the, the wish is that you never need the legal system. Um, and this mediation act makes that possible for the first time. Why? Because for the first time, here we have a piece of law that says that mediators can draft a document that the parties themselves intend to be binding between them. Nobody else, not a court. What year was this law? You said 2000? Uh, 2018, 2018 is 2018. when it came in, the, the 1st of January and 2018. We've, we've had it, we've had it since 1996. Can you imagine? Oh, okay. Well, you're oh, ahead of us. We've had it. We had it. We're way ahead. But the problem is that people yeah. have been saying that we don't have a law on mediation. Can you imagine in a country where I'm saying we have the best law on mediation just because we got it at, an, at a point of time where Ancitral was using the word conciliation. So it is called conciliation and it gave an opportunity to pe for people to say we don't have a law on mediation. I have to educate them that first of all understand that the Ancitral was using that word today in their own, the model law they've come out with, they have clarified very well, clearly that mediation, your conciliation was the word we were using. There is no difference between mediation and conciliation. It is just that this word has become more popular. So now we are using yeah. the word mediation. So nicely they put it down. But of course, it is. it helps people to confuse people, mislead people. Yeah. I'm saying they're misleading people. So the in terms of legislation today, well, I, I said that there is a bill in parliament. That's not law. It's just a bill. Today we have a law. Look at that law. It gives I mean, look, this aspect about helping the parties put together a settlement agreement. 
Hmm. Perfectly all right. It's their words. It's their. I mean, if they don't want to put it down on paper, someone else does it for them. Where's the issue? I don't. You're not giving advice to them. You are putting down what they've recorded. People have been doing that for years in our courts. The, the illiterate yes. people used to come, and people used. Someone was there to put it down on their affidavits and everything. They did not have that. They did not put it down. Someone else, and this person was not a lawyer. And people were typing out for them. So someone recording what you're saying is becoming an issue for people. I think I mean I'm telling you this is you'll just go on. You'll, you'll at least you're part of the. It's a group of people that at least is looking at it. They, we don't have that group developing, because everyone is so connected with the court system, and the whole thing of judges. I was speaking to someone today that tomorrow's session, please come in. But the person had that thing. Look, I am still connected with the court system. Should I be talking about it? So that fear that the judges have created, and that's the only place lawyers are working. So they don't want to say anything which might offend them. So these are issues which will continue. Though you never move out of it. I'm sorry, you were saying something. No, no. I think that, I think you, you're. I think what's really interesting about these conversations that you've set up is this: the really similar problems are happening in pretty much every country where mediation is, is trying to move through. And for such an old skill set and an old um, service, if you like, it's surprisingly unevolved in terms of, of the, uh, people taking it up, understanding it, knowing it. And um, there is, okay, I think I'm not understating it, that, the, that what happens in Ireland in the next few months is going to be of crucial importance to Europe, the development of mediation in Europe, because we have come to a crunch point. So the, so the law came in and the law has got some great stuff in it that really protects the diversity of mediation and also firmly puts all of the control in the hands of the participants. That, that to me is the most important thing that happened. And also a statutory confidentiality protection came in we never had that so now we have it and it and it's set it out in black and white that this is a confidential process and nobody can break in there least of all the courts which is really important yeah, because we just, have had cases where the courts have been forcing me, mediators to come into court so no, I, yeah I, I don't know whether i should i can okay I, i'll cut you I, mean, I don't want to cut you off i'll i'll, I'll, I'll well, just well i kind of i want to say what's coming next because the coming next piece probably ties in more with what your concerns are from from where you you stand part of this act has a schedule at the back of it and the schedule is to establish a mediation council of ireland and the idea of this council was to set training standards to promote mediation in fact the first objective is to promote mediation to raise awareness um, to set up a national registry of mediators so that, that, that they're conforming to any national codes that might be brought in. While this is a good initiation of something, we've got to be really careful that this council doesn't get driven by interests that are divert, away from the interests of mediation as, as a profession. And what's happening right now is that there are five seats on this council to represent the interests of mediators or to promote mediation. So bodies who are representing mediators or bodies who promote mediation can seek to get one of the five seats. And six of the seats would be public interest seats. And we all know the public interest seats are, they're not people who are going to be overtly interested in mediation. So they will go with the flow of what the five are saying, I would think, <laughs> you know, that's, that's oh. human nature. So, what worries me was up until uh, last week, <laughs> it was proposed that two legal professions would take a seat. So the Law Society, the Bar Council, another professional group take a seat, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, um, and then one seat for one professional body of mediators in Ireland and one seat potentially for a community mediation group if it comes together. And I've objected to this because will have the seats to represent the development of mediation dominated by three professions whose core function is not to promote mediation. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, ref I, I have been vociferous in my objections and, and interesting, Ireland is a small place. And if you're, if you're, as a mediator, I've never belonged to any political 
entity or political party. I have I have very good connections across multiple political parties and opposition. And you know, so I've never taken the political space, which has always been very strong, because you can speak to all of these groups when something like this happens. Um, and so what I'm hoping is the pressure has uh, that we have brought and others have brought have opened up the discussions again. And it's no longer accepted that those five entities would have those seats. And we're entering into a new phase of consultations to, to decide what five entities should go for these five seats. I'm saying, yeah, but this fact that you're even discussing this. I know. I'm, I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just saying that we're going into a direction which actually has, I mean, it has nothing to do with mediation, according to me still. Promoting mediation like it's, is the simplest thing to do in terms of putting it out as language that connecting people to the process, which is the easiest to do. But when yeah. you complicate it with all that, first of all, the user, I mean, the user wants something simple and you want to give the user something so simple, which is what our law today is. It is confidentiality protected on a national basis without prejudice protected, the mediator not being called in as a witness, all that protected by law, we've got that. You don't need anything more. But also on the other side, it is so simple in terms of steps put there that a layman can understand it. You don't, you are, we still, look, I can't say about Ireland, of course, your diversity or your urbanization, rural population, I, 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 will, I mean, you can do a little Google search, but that doesn't matter. We're, we're, Here, we're nearly at 5 million. I think we've just got over 5 million, our latest okay. census. Yeah. That's it? That's yep, it. That's five million. That's it. Yep. So imagine, imagine what applies to you. They want the same to apply to a country with 1.3 billion people with 60% rural population. It's just, I'm telling you, some people sit somewhere with so far removed from reality. You're looking at a legislation which will look so complicated that a person sitting in a village would have to go to a lawyer to understand that with the legislation. You want the empowerment of the people today with that legislation that we have, it can't be better. It can't be better. And in a country where definitely the judicial system is the, I keep saying the most inefficient institution, the judiciary, and you're denying justice to people. And I, I keep repeating, I like to do it. So let me do it. <laughs> because <laughs> justice delayed is justice denied. So I, if you're doing it to them, they have, it's their opportunity to do this in their space the way they want to do it, with the person they want to do it. And this law gives that particular settlement agreement the same status as a court decree. Can it get better for a person sitting in that village whom you have, in a way, totally ignored, put them into sub -har such hardships, and whenever some discussion will come out, some way, kind of one-off one kind of situation will be quoted. That person is living that every day of their lives. You put them, you can't even imagine, some, some of our high courts will be about 1,500 kilometers from someone's village. The Supreme Court will be 2,500, maybe three, about 2,500 kilometers from someone's village. What kind? What are you doing to them? I mean, really, I don't even understand. You even know reality, and who who uh, puts it out? The chief justice of the country goes out and says that forms a committee that let's put together or put together a draft bill, a mediation bill. What does the chief justice of India have to do with mediation? I don't understand. Is but it is because that, is, is that how it got initiated? Yes, it yes, Chief yes. Justice? and the people who got together in that committee gave a certain draft, and in that they thought again we're making a mediation council of India. What their interest in it is, I also would not know. I don't even want to get into it. They put it out. It went to the government. Government immediately, they of course these people wanted some representation of mediators. It changed the every, entire thing. Basically, the majority became bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one person who had some academic kind of background in terms of dispute resolution. The other was also something like that. They never said practicing mediators or anything there as I see it. So the fact that you change the whole concept and then, of course, the whole complicated thing and trying to regulate and where should we regulate. And then there will be regulations on the regulations. They will come out with a bill and so and so mediation council will come out with that regulation on online dispute resolution there will be regulations put by them what are you doing so me talking to someone on zoom also you will control i mean come off it let's just get over this entire colonization mindset let's, at some stage well let's get let's get simpler in our thinking to me what i what i would like to see happen in my lifetime is that 
the normal thing to do with any form of dispute is to go to mediation. You don't pick up the phone to a solicitor. You just you contact your nearest mediator and you just see, can you set up a mediation session? Whatever the dispute is, whatever the problem is. Uh, yeah. And that it's something that is commonly available on the ground in your village, in your city, in your in your area, that it's 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 as normal as having the dentist uh, nearby or your GP. I, I want it to be. I'm hoping to see that within the next decade, that that is that's where we're going, that this this within the Irish context is that's the normal step. And what I do think is really important about legislation is that when I say choose to go to mediation and I get an agreement, let's say let's try different disputes, because I think it's because they're not all the same type of thing. So let's say I've gone. I've got a dispute with my business partner and I go to mediation and we work out an agreement between us. And the agreement is over a period of time, he buys out, buys out my interest in the business and we'll unwind it this way. And this is what we're going to do. The legislation piece is really important because what it does, those are our intentions. As you said, those intentions are just written down like they were ever written down. <laughs> um, but if one of us in bad faith turns around and doesn't do what we've written down. The legislation now in Ireland allows me to take that agreement to a court to enforce it. It's a, it's an, it's a protective piece only if I choose to take it there. My agreement is not linked to the court, but I'm given that choice to protect the agreement if I want to. Let me tell you, Roshan, all contracts are like that. All and contracts they, can be entered into by people themselves. Absolutely. They don't need a lawyer to put a contract together. It's just a contract. So to say yeah. that you are getting into a contract, every contract now we will start looking into. We will regulate how you will get into the contract. Who's going to help you do make that contract? Look, it's just, we have to. I mean, telling you this colonization mindset will keep hitting <laughs> us in all directions. Always, it is just their agreement we can't start telling everyone in our country or in the world that these are the people you have to sit with if you want to enter into any agreement we have verbal agreements or contracts in our country i don't know about ireland you have verbal contracts or, or i mean verbal agreements or contracts it's mm. going to be verbal also so now we will have someone who's going to you have to be sitting next to when you speak when I say something to you, I'll have to have someone that you will designate to be sitting there. These are agreements. They're all agreements. A settlement agreement is an agreement between parties. They, they can put it together the way they want to put it together. And, and I, but I agree with you. And that's actually what the, the legislation does in Ireland. It says it reinforces the idea that a mediation, it, it, the thing that comes out of mediation is now called a mediation settlement under this legislation. But this mediation settlement, it's just stating really clearly, this is essentially contract law governing this agreement. And it just it just puts it in black and white because oddly enough, in the 12 years that I've been practicing, over and over again, I've had solicitors telling the parties that I'm working with, the participants, that a mediated agreement isn't isn't capable of being enforced, isn't like a contract, isn't, you know, and that that's just not the case. <laughs> our thing, now, our even better, our settlement yeah. agreement under that law, all you have to say is that this particular, we are doing this under this Arbitration and Conciliation Act, that's all you have to say. You, like I said, everything protected, confidentiality, without prejudice, everything protected, plus that settlement agreement is as good a court decree by just using that one sentence. You don't have to make out any agreement of all these confidentiality being written it and being signed by the parties. And well, in no, India... And we're, we're the yeah. same. We're the same. As long as, if you reference that your, your agreement is done in accordance with the Mediation Act, the provisions of the Mediation Act 2017, that's it you don't have to say anything more right. and the structure of your agreement is completely up to you <laughs> so so i think that's I, I think really what i'm very pleased about is that the framework is there to protect those who want to use mediation and it stops those whose interests don't align with people going to mediation it stops them challenging the results of mediation the outcomes of mediation because they those outcomes belong to the parties and they belong to the people who choose mediation and they it is separate to the court system it's a separate space and it needs to be the first space yeah. i'm i'm still, i'm look i'm keep saying that it's not the first space for me first i'm trying to put together what i call peacemakers and mediators so a village okay. peacemaker you have a village <clears> peacemaker <throat> who if you have a dispute you so this is this person you're talking yeah. to now 
the person first of all attempts to get you people to sit together this person is not a mediator just why are you fighting just sit together and now you're not trying to like i said not mediating that person is not mediating but if it seems that this is not working out that person has identified a person with a mediator mindset in that village or otherwise wherever yeah. and then tells these people look i think this person let's bring this person in so the, the person is working with them and bringing a person whom they have identified and they, they have identified because people have identified those people brings that person in and then they try to resolve it it's it's all something which can happen within themselves and step by step so i'm i'm look for me i have to start from that perspective because 60% of the population if it is in that kind of situation i can't send them to a lawyer the yeah. moment you've gone to a lawyer exactly what you said the language of that notice will have allegations with those people will never be able to get out the they took when you say when the lawyer sends a notice the for the person who's receiving the notice it has come from the person who sent it not the lawyer so yeah. they think that this person is saying this to us not realizing yeah. that person did not have any control the kind of language i read sometimes i mean you say in a and you're doing a mediation and then in that there is some situation where of course a limitation is coming up and the notice has to be sent so they it comes to me and i tell them look why are you writing this kind of a thing you know you know what our language has been the way the kind of things that you can say about the criminal thing we will do this i mean yeah just tone it down you uh, but this is something that i this is something i said to you earlier <clears throat> because when i got the letters myself <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going too much talking when i got the letter myself when i was going through the the legal separation the words that came from the solicitor to me that i saw i I know now that those words didn't come from the other person, the, the, the person that I was married to. But this was the language of the advers- adversarial system. Yeah. And that language is combative. And, and that's the training that's received. Not all lawyers write those kinds of letters, but I've seen too many of those kinds of letters to know that it's not uncommon. So, uh, so, yeah. so yeah. And that, saying, yeah. Yeah. yeah, please, please. But but the key the key difference between me as a mediator and say a lawyer or a solicitor is that a mediator advocates for everybody in the mediation, <clears throat> including the children and even the extended family. Whereas a lawyer, their training is to only advocate for the client that they have to the detriment of, of everybody else. Absolutely. That might be a bit harsh, but that's my experience of the system. Oh, true, that's true, and that is where I think that instead of now trying to regulate mediation, I think all these people, whoever the government or the judiciary, they should be working on the lawyers, get them to understand that their profession was not this. Their profession, if it was called a noble profession, was because someone, when they came to you, you were looking at their interest and whatever was best for them. If you had to reach out to the other person, you can. It's not that best because someone has come to you. Now you become their lawyer and I can't reach. No, you reach out. I've done that. I'm, I've been telling people, people give examples on arbitration. I am a lawyer for someone in arbitration. I have reached out to the other side. They have been, they've come into that mediation and not had their lawyers come in that's the kind of trust you have to develop that's the that's the professional you were supposed to be so i just to accept what these people are doing i think that is where you're going wrong they're going wrong you don't accept this thing it's not the way you were supposed to be and if you're not doing it properly look at how you can regulate them not try to get into people who are <laughs> totally in a different side altogether they're trying to look <clears throat> if we look at the development of, of legal systems and law, they're so old and we know you and I are we're of an age where we know that we can see that old systems change slowly. They're, they're also resistant to change. And the, the legal system in Ireland, the, the, the courts, the dance, it's a dance. The, the custom and practice, it's so entrenched and so old. And what's happening is that mediation is beginning to bash at the door of this institution and say we're different we're doing something in, informal but we're giving people what they need and i think the two systems are colliding at the moment in ireland 
But you um, know, the, the collision will obviously it had it has happened not today. It's happened for us obviously somewhere down way back, and no one saw that this collision. Someone just took over, and it was like a cycle being trampled over by a truck kind of thing. That happened. <laughs> it's in otherwise in 1996 it could have moved in the right direction, but it will all happen. These old systems change very fast when they can take advantage of what is happening. So, like I said, yes. I was telling you about the judges. They shift their whole concept. Because in one of the articles, one other judge countered this mediator who wrote the same thing, and very interestingly said that by someone setting up a private thing, and if the mediation doesn't have to be promoted as free, 17 years first mediation center in the court started in 2005. In 17 years, you have given it free to people. You have destroyed mediation because there was no one values mediation because it comes for free. They don't value mediators because they get nothing. It's a, we're living in a society which is a materialistic society. They gauge people by what they get. And here you gave them nothing. And suddenly now it became convenient because mediation is being spoken about so much. So now let's look at it from the private th part of it. And all these 17 years, all these people in the court system who said they were trying to do some larger good because they were not getting nothing out of it. It was just Passion. Now they were stupid. So I am just reaching out. I'm saying or telling all mediators in court systems all over the world, don't do it for free. Just don't do it because they're just using you. And the moment they got the opportunity, they set up their own center. And whatever way, whether there was a corrupt practice or not, that's a truth. someone else to look at. Just the fact that you were trying to now put down this free activity that you were the one who started. So well, I you're, think you're, this you're, you're hitting no no you're hitting on something that I feel very strongly about here as well. So so in the late 1980s, the Irish state set up a free family mediation service, and it was very in, innovative. Nobody else in Europe was doing it, and so anybody could come to the state for free free mediation for anything to do with a family dispute. And then over time, they piloted putting those mediators into the courts, and so they sat in the courtrooms. Um, the uptake was never huge. Um, the, you, you, you think it would be when it was free, but what really bothered me, there were two things that, and they still do, the pay level is very low for those mediators. Like, so, so their services are not being valued by a state that is benefiting from them giving that service. Exactly. And the second piece is the family mediation service in Ireland is overwhelmed. So the waiting lists are 16, 22 weeks, some, some I've heard 30 something weeks recently. And that means families aren't getting that service in a timely manner. And so the issue is that they opened it up to, there's no means testing, anybody can come get it, which means those who really need it the most, who can't afford a private lawyer, who can't afford a private mediator, they're not getting the access to the system that they should have. So I think there are two pieces here. I would agree with you. The state should not pay less or pay very little to mediators because the state is showing it doesn't value the service while at the same time offering it through the court system as a free service to the public. So Roisha, what I'm trying to say is that it's a court, okay? So in a court, yeah. you set up a mediation sector. In the court, litigation is also taking place. Both of them taking yes. place in the same court. Litigation, you are saying that in that kind of activity, the lawyer can charge what they want because mm -hmm. it is litigation. And isn't litigation something that is in some way connected to dispute resolution? Isn't it connected to that dispute? But when it moves to the mediation center, suddenly we want to regulate, we want to put some whatever, if it's an honorarium in some places, it's an honorarium, very, very basic yeah. amount. We want to control that. I still haven't been able to understand, but I do understand it. The problem is that the courts actually cannot send you to mediation because the whole constitutional setup is that you are supposed to give that justice that you talk about, that justice is coming from a system that people have come for. So the argument created around was mediation is access to justice. They started creating that argument. I think the EU also took that up. With that. Yeah. So now take it to that direction. How is it access to justice? Ask every mediator. They will tell you that they have told people that if you go to the courts, it'll take 10 years, 15 years, you should <laughs> settle it. Everyone tells you, is that now a person settling it because there is that gun on their head or look, no one can take the risk in countries, certain countries, the costs are so high. Supposing it yeah. doesn't go in your favor. The costs are so high, you might go bankrupt just paying those costs. Who knows what the condition of that person is? So it's a gamble. They say, I won't take the gamble. Okay, I'll settle. That's not justice for them. I don't yeah. want mediation to be promoted saying that it's fast, it's cheap. 
no it does not do that it's not no. fast or anything the court system has to become efficient you have to get your house in order which is what i keep i was give that example about that last symposium chuck who's from israel now living in yeah. germany he gave that example he said israel mediation has taken off germany it hasn't because the german courts are really efficient so i don't i feel perfectly all right if people are finding justice there and they want to go there don't promote mediation against that mediation has to be promoted as an as a totally different dispute resolution process you're looking at uh, the other person looking at their their, their needs i am saying it has to be value based that negotiation so that's why you're getting into it so that's i suppose i suppose i'd like to distinguish between if we look at families okay so so families that that say have to access the courts so parenting financial arrangements separations divorces i've done a lot of research in the district court and the circuit court here and oh we've somebody coming in rosalia that's the next session that's the next session coming okay. <laughs> rosalia let me has, meet rosalia rosalia <laughs> please meet roshan roshan am i getting it right roshan 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 hi yeah. rosalia <laughs> um hi uh, rosalia is in uh, montreal she yes. of course will introduce herself before the next session so i won't introduce her right now so okay. we, because we'll have to we'll have to we are we just conclude and rosalia will also have something maybe to say but we might not get, give you time rosalia so we'll have to just maybe be a spectator for two minutes because we'll have to shut the close that session we're, yeah. we're Sorry, almost done you'll, you'll just um, have to be a spectator now that we'll give you in at the next session because we'll have to just conclude this one yeah oh, yes so i think the important thing is that families uh in the cases that i watched in the district court or the circuit court it isn't the case that families go in one time to the court and they get sorted and they leave they, if they get attached into the court system they can they need to come again and again and again at least these are the cases that i saw so you have families coming in and out for 10 years in and out of the court system my hope is that we we front end we get in front of the court system and and everybody goes to mediation and perhaps perhaps and this is the big one <laughs> i'm becoming in favor of mandatory mediation before you can litigate because i think i i i ran a research project to see what this work and so the people who thought that they'd been ordered there by judges came to mediation and 86% of them stayed once they had that first chat so I think if we say please try mediation before you even try and litigate unless the litigation piece is absolutely essential because there's something some issue that has to be dealt with so I think we we can't have the idea that mediation is quick and easy and way cheap because <laughs> that undervalues what the whole what mediation is we can't have states governments in different countries paying mediators very little money and attaching that service to the courts like in Canada I I was um I was talking at the ADR BC um sim- symposium and 27 years have gone by since the the rates were set for for mediators for the for the court panel and that rate hasn't improved it hasn't increased that doesn't make any sense to me you you should pay mediators what they're worth but also um our priority is to get people but not to not think about court to, to to do the mediation piece first no, i'm saying that the fact that you just said that you should pay mediators why if you want to make it mandatory make it mandatory the mediator has to get market price they have to they charge yes. what they want yes. you if they the people have to challenge the fact that whether you should it should be made mandatory or not that's for the people to do but you can't make it mandatory at the cost of the mediator i mean why i'm tell you okay let me tell you what happens after this so step 2 which is again the us experience the courts it's almost free so people the lawyers have taken over lawyers get their hefty fees they pick up a mediator from the court system that mediator gets nothing so at the end of the day the lawyer is getting whatever they have to get the mediator thinks that they'll be recognized by the lawyers they'll get private work they don't get private work they get frustrated and disillusion they move out a new lot comes in and then again they get disillusion disillusion they move out and we had jeff kechavin who's a very senior mediator in the us and he only practices as a mediator like i said there were only few people who are like that and he spoke about his own experience this was what was happening to him and when someone said that i mean he said you know that you used me here some private way so why should we give you private work so that's one example there's one in india who gave an example where some people came to him and of course he gave his fee which was market fee 
they, the lawyers told them we'll get him appointed through the court system. They went and did that. I mean, yeah. if the lawyers are going to misuse it, why? For what are you doing it? Let the uh, make it. I'm saying make it totally mandatory. You have to go to a mediator. You don't fix the price for mediators. Who are you no. to fix price for mediator? They are a professionals. If you want to make it a profession, they're, they're professionals. I, I guess, how do they get away with it? I'm trying to understand that. I do agree with that. The only piece that I would say I would still like to see an offering to those to people who cannot afford a private mediator. So I think there needs to be a state offering there. Yeah, that's the, the yeah. difference. We had a session on free versus pro bono. And this is where as actually this came from Jeff only. He has, he's the one who spoke about the fact that he was giving this address to the Beverly Hills Bar Association. He says, why are you giving it to who are the people around in this area, these large companies and everything, and you're giving them to free for what? Pro bono means that someone can't afford it and someone wants to, yes, wants to yeah. practice as a mediator for those people. Not a problem at all. But free, for what reason? I mean, there's no, it doesn't seem to be any. And I'm telling you the reason is this, because someone will challenge the whole concept that how can you send it for mediation? So just to keep them quiet, we are giving it free. So you have no disadvantage. It's not, it's, uh, that process is under the constitutional process because you are inefficient. Your inefficiencies we should take care of. You make your, get your houses on. I'm telling you about this Chief Justice who made this committee. You know where our civil procedure code is? What year? Just a guess. Our no, civil procedure code. We got independence in 1947. Our civil procedure yes. code is 1908. Our <laughs> Indian Penal Code, 1860. These are laws that you have to look at as the if you do if you want to, to get into laws, but law is not your area. You're a you're a you're the judiciary. Leave that to the parliament to do. You want to recommend, make a committee to draft laws now. You want to get into what the parliament has to do also. That's the way we have created the judiciary, this whole colonial setup, putting them on a pedestal. Here it's even it's so opaque. The, even the system of judiciary, I don't know how it works in, in Ireland. They've made their so own system themselves. With whom they will make the next judge, they will decide. The people have the. But what, but what I suggest, Vikram, we don't need to worry about that structure and that system because it is, and it, over time it's going to change. What we should be putting our energies into is how do we get mediation in front of that system? And how do we create that as an absolute first step that everybody thinks about straight away and says, oh, I need to go to mediation. To that's the piece you. that we haven't got going yet. And that's, I, when I say we, I mean mediators across the world. We, we're responsible for getting that. No, Roshan, into... I'll tell you why we're connected to that. Because I'm telling you, I in a mediation don't want to tell them that you, you, uh, you settle because otherwise it'll take you 20 years. That's no reason to be in mediation. That's a wrong way of going about promoting mediation. And if they don't get their house in order, that's what we'll keep doing. And that's, I know you get your, you give a person, whatever justice, if you want to call it justice, give it in what, three days. If someone is in jail, how can you keep them for one hour also in jail? Give them, how are you to put someone who's innocent into jail, first of all? And those kind of prisons that you've created, that colonial system gave you a prison, that whole concept of the way the whole reforms had to happen did not happen because they got, got away with it. So I'm saying, question that. Don't let them get away. Make them efficient and let people come in for mediation because they want, they think it is a process which works with the way they want to settle with another person because it is another person. It is a person that you're dealing with and the relationship with this individual or people in general moving out into a totally con different mindset altogether. It's a, that is the way we, I want to promote it. I, I, this is no way to do it against them, their inefficiencies. I think that's just the way they go. I don't know. Well, I think I'm going to gently leave you now because I think I've been here probably too long. <laughs> this is really interesting. And I think um, you and I have similar aspirations for where mediation can go, what we can do with it. I think we have similar frustrations with the other dispute resolution forum, the main one, which is the court system. And I think I've decided to, because I'm getting older, <laughs> I've decided to put my energy into the spaces where I know I can make change and I can help make change in the space of mediation and I can help drive it on in Ireland and I'm linking across Europe and with the support of other mediators we can drive it on together so I think what we should do is pick our battles which is a strange expression for mediators but let's pick our battles and let's really focus on our profession and and the development of our space so that the public wherever just says oh yeah 
I go to mediation first. That's the place where I go take my dispute. Yeah. So on that note, I'm going to leave you. Thank you, Rashid. Thanks a lot. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, guys. Enjoy the next session. <laughs> yeah. Let me just cut.